Alrighty, so today we're gonna be talking about cash and cash patterns specifically. My name is Vasily Olinik, you are watching the .NET Architecture series where we are building a modular monolith notification system from scratch using industry's best practices. So this is not gonna be the usual Redis run-of-the-mill kind of video where we set up Redis and try to cache stuff in it. For that I have another link in the description down below where I've covered the topic already. Today we're gonna be talking about cache in general and cache design patterns. However, there are more than just one or two ways to do that and to implement caching at all. The first type of caching that we're gonna cover is response caching and it's really easy to configure. If we go to our program that says all we need to do is basically somewhere inside our installer services, just add response caching and then inside our middleware, basically app, specify that app use response caching. I don't really like response caching. Well, it has its own place and its own benefit, but I don't quite like it since all the control and all the power is on the client side. What I mean by that, response caching is basically just telling the client for how long it should cache the data. If it requests the data once again, it will still hit our endpoint and still go to the database and query our data and return it to the client. Basically, I have no control over it. So I just say that, hey, cache it for this amount of time. And I believe you that you will cache it there and not request it again. But if you want to request it again, you can do so. And I'll just give you a new set of data or the same data over again. This issue is really fixed with the second type of cache that we're gonna cover, which is output cache. So let me first just remove response caching from here and we can go to the configure output cache installer over here. We could add output cache and specify some options. These options are basically the policies that we want to use inside our API or our system. Over here I have set up two different policies. So the base policy is to cache everything. And then I have a custom policy, the get applications, uh, by the name of get applications, uh, which says that we want to cache with an expiry time of one minute and we want to vary by the header. Uh, by the header based on page, page size, sort column and sort order. And we want to tag this kind of cache with the tag get applications. Uh, to see this in practice, we just need to go to our application registry endpoints over here and take a look at our get applications query where I have said I've added the add cache output with the get applications name of the policy, which is this one over here. And basically all our requests will make use of output caching for this specific API endpoint. Uh, now let me debug the solution and we'll see this in practice. Now, inside our API, we have this get applications endpoint, we have, which we have covered previously. So if you want to try it out and specify that we want an ascending and page one and we want an elements, once I hit this execute button, we're gonna hit the endpoint of our API and then return all the data from the database, but any subsequent requests for the same data will hit will work against the cache. So once I hit execute, we can see that we have hit our endpoint over here. I'll just press continue and return back to the Safari. And over here we have our data, which is notifications, basically just the single item that we have in there with a page of one and page size of 10. So once I hit this execute method again, we're not gonna hit the endpoints themselves. We're just gonna return the data from cache. So. As you can see, it's blazingly fast and it's basically returned from the cache. However, if we change this to 12 and hit execute, we're gonna hit the endpoint since we set up in our policy that we want to vary by page, size, sort column and sort order. So if any of these parameters is different from any previous request, we're gonna hit the endpoint once again. So if I hit resume, return back to Safari, basically we have the page size 12. Now, there is one more thing in here, which is cache invalidation and which has been a pain over the years for many developers. Cache invalidation has been really a breeze with output cache since we have this notion of tag, 
which is get applications. And we can basically set up an endpoint or any kind of logic behind the scenes where we can evict by tag. So if I query for the data once again, just to ensure that it's running the cache, then I want to run it and invalidate my uh, cache. Once I hit this endpoint again, we can see that we have hit the endpoint. I'll just resume and go back to the method itself which is really easy. So since we need just to inject the output cache store and specify that we want to evict by tag the data from the cache. And yeah, that's basically everything you need in order to set up output cache inside an API. Back to the main points that we want to mention. Now, output cache has a couple of queries over there. So first of all, it caches only 200 responses. Second, it works only on get and head methods. Third, responses to authentication requests are also not cached. And fourth, basically output cache works with in-memory provider, which is a real bummer since we don't have any way to natively support Redis. Nick Chapsos has a really nice video about that, which I will link down below, where he tweaks around the output cache and basically uses Redis with a central, like in a centralized way. But with that said, let's take a look at the third way we can set up our cache inside our API. So I'm gonna stop this and basically close this too and go to cache service. And now quick disclaimer, if you have never configured Redis for .NET application, I have a full tutorial covering it from scratch to the end uh, inside my YouTube channel, which I will link in the description below. You can go and check it out and basically see for yourself how to set up cache in general with Redis. But for now, basically this is a simple setup for adding our Redis cache, where we basically set up the connection multiplexer to connect to our Redis, which is running in Docker container. And over here we have an add scope service, which is an iCache service with a Redis cache service implementation. And if we take a look at the interface itself, it has basically two methods, the get value async and set value async. Many of you will tell you that this kind of pattern works really well when you want to abstract away the infrastructure and indeed they are right. But in my personal experience, I've never went over ready. So we've always gone back to it and used it stably inside all our systems. However, the main benefit from this approach, in my opinion, is the most powerful pattern from the gang of four, in my opinion, which is the decorator pattern. And we can set up a two level cache in here. First of all, being the in-memory cache and then being the Redis cache. So we, both of those can implement the iCache service. Well, one will decorate on top of the other and that way when a request comes in, it will it can first check in the local memory of the API, then go to Redis and only afterwards hit the database if necessary. Now inside our application registry over here, we have a cross-cutting uh, folder with an application repository cache decorator, which essentially is a decorator on top of the I application repository. And I'm using Scrunner for that. If we take a look at application registry, we can see that I have decorated the I application repository with a cache over here. Now, the implementation itself is really simple. So take, let's take a look at the get by code async method over here. And we have basically a cache key, which is really similar to the tag that we have seen previously. Then we get cache, we check the cache service if it can get an application with this specific key, which is the application underscore code. If it's not null, we return the cached application. If it's null, we get it from the next chain in our decorator chain. Uh, if the application is null, we return null. If we found the value, we first set it inside the cache and then return it back to our caller. Now, this is really similar to how middleware and filters work, which essentially are two decorator pattern-like components. Now, those three, the response, the output, and the distributed cache approaches are the most popular on the internet and the most popular in the industry. 
However, when we deal with cache, there are a couple of design patterns as well that you can implement. And the decorator is a basic example of that. However, there are much more. So the decorator part over here where we just check first the cache, then we go to the database and then retrieve the data from database, cache it and return it to the client is called demand cache or set aside cache pattern. Uh, all these patterns will have different names. So you can find in the literature or on tutorials different names. The first time I encountered it, it was demand cache, which stuck with me for the rest of my life. The second design pattern that you might encounter is called primed cache and it's vice versa. Basically over here in demand cache, we just store the cache once it has been requested. In primed cache, you just set up all your cached data when the application itself starts up. That has saved me in the past a couple of times. Uh, a basic example would be some form of report for about a month or a year, which is hard to generate and which is basically really often requested. So you can just prime it up into cache before even the application starts. And once that application starts, if the user requests that report, you don't have to go to the database, query it, everything, cache it aside, and then return it to the user, which saves you a couple of seconds over there. And now comes the fun part. So first of all, uh, cache search sequence. Cache search sequence is basically a pattern that is associated with how the well with the performance and how data is searched inside a cache. This is the basic structure in the UML and in my personal experience many of the different providers be it the Java, the Oracle, the Redis cache provider they all have different uh, implementations of this cache search sequence which basically is the main difference between speed of different cache providers. And if you're interested into how Redis is so performant and how it works behind the scenes, you can take a look at the cache search sequence and read about it on the internet. Uh, the next one being cache replicator and it's basically how we replicate cache across multiple cache instances, which have which we can have a peer cache replicator, we can have a centralized cache replicator. And basically the structure in the UML for it is something like this. However, those are really vague and the implementation, the real implementations for different providers will probably differ, but it will still have something like this. And the easy implementation for the centralized cache replicator might be even the decorator pattern where you have some form of middleware that knows about all the other cache instances. And once new data needs to be cached, it will just basically replicate this cache across all the instances that it knows of. And essentially it basically isolates the strategy that we implement well, that the vendor implements in order to cache and to spread the cache itself. Uh, next one, cache collector, which is basically everything about how you purge data from the cache. In high load system, Cache is a limited resource, so you might be approaching the limit of your cache and you will need to purge data from it. There are a couple of ways to do that with a fixed expiration, inactive expiration, sliding windows, etc. For example, there is a list over here, you can see list recently used expiration where the cache exceeds its size and basically you will need to purge all the data that is not really often accessed. However, even these rules are really situational. In my past experience, we had a couple of systems that were generating large reports. And basically those reports were not all that often requested. However, they took a long time to generate. So we basically just cached those reports aside and saved our application from having to go through all the tables, all the database and just gather the data, run some filters on it, etc., etc. We basically just cached it there. It was not often requested, but it was hard to generate and we had a real benefit from having it there stored inside the cache. Now, the most important part is the cache statistics in my opinion. And like always, this is not really documented since it's use case specific. 
However, you should make sure that you have some statistics that run on top of your cache. Like for example, how many round trips to the database has the cache saved you from? Basically, if you have some form of data that you request a hundred times over, it basically means that you saved yourself 99 round trips to the database. Another common statistic will, would be the pool size, which in under normal circumstances, the pool size of the cache should not grow exponentially or continuously. Now, the ironic thing is here the pattern itself does not specify anything besides the name. So every kind of strategy that you imply in order to gather data about how your cache is performing is called cache statistics. Irony in itself. Now, a small bonus is Entity Framework, which has one more pattern. Basically, it's the two-level cache. First of all, the first level is the context cache or the local cache. And what it is about is basically if an entity is already loaded to the local DB context, so you have already once queried for the data, if you run another query for the same data, it will basically give it to you from the memory. And like that entity framework saves round trips to the database as well. Entity framework level two cache is really similar to to the decorator part that we have implemented previously. And you have a lot of different Nougat packages that will allow you to configure it really straightforward like ncache. I'll leave the link to the Nougat package and to the tutorial to configure it in the description below. From the last and more used patterns is the read-through and write-through. And the basic example for that is CDN, where the data first the request flows through cache first and then hits the application. Basically, your application will make a request to the cache to fetch the request data. And if the data is available locally, the cache will return it. If not, it will go to the source of the data, retrieve it from there, store it inside the CDN and return it back to you. Basically, how a CDN works, really. Uh, that said, those will be the most popular and the more often ways you are going to use cache inside your APIs of the other being just some variations or combinations of the same basic uh, design patterns. Other than that, thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel over here somewhere. I'll leave a link to the Redis cache implementation uh, video with .NET Core. And yeah, see you next time.